Okay, everybody hear me all right? Okay, well, I uh, really appreciate the invitation to uh, be here today and represent NRCS. Just show of hands, how many of y'all have worked with NRCS or are aware of what NRCS does? Okay, looks like most of the room here, so I'm, I'm going to dive right into it. Uh, what I want to do with this presentation today is um, share the perspective that we have from, I'd say, inside the agency looking out. Our number one goal is to advise landowners to work with resource concerns on private land. And so I'm going to target, of course, prairie restoration today and some of those projects we've been working on. And I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go over in detail some of the challenges that we have uh, in working with folks and, and hopefully uh, create some good discussion for us today. Okay, so the first thing, uh, it sounds to me like everyone here is uh, very well versed in how a prairie functions, so I won't belabor that point uh, a whole lot. I will talk a lot about the tall grass prairie and, and how that pertains to this region and up through central Texas. One of the, the, the things that uh, we feel is very important is to recognize that those historical drivers of herbivory and, uh, and fire, and on the herbivory side, if you think historically three, 400 years ago, the herbivory that occurred was periodic and it wasn't a constant pressure. And so I think that's one of the big drivers. You know, most folks that come through the door to work with our agency, I'd say the majority of them have some sort of agricultural production type interest. A lot of those are livestock operators. And so if you want native grass on your place, and you intend to not move cattle or rotationally graze or something like that, those two goals don't always go together very well um, at all, as a matter of fact. And so that's something important, that grazing dynamic, how that infrequent grazing occurred, and the rest that followed it probably, uh, just as importantly, uh, is a huge point. Uh, I noticed with some of the other presenters uh, from um, earlier today and yesterday, that uh, they talked a lot about the microbial community and the soil life. And that's a, that's a topic that our agency is looking at more and more. We call it the underground herd. We actually, I was telling someone at lunch, started a whole new division the other day um, with USDA called Soil Health Division. And they're looking a lot at these microbial interactions below the soil surface and looking how that nutrient cycle functions. And so that goes hand in hand with the physical soil scientist, but it also introduces a new way of testing soils and looking to see what it takes to get a proper functioning soil and maybe maintain some of these plant communities that we're interested in. Fire, I think, goes without saying. That disturbance that was there on those relic prairies that was a huge driver. We feel some of those plants are fire responsive. Fire plays a key role in some of the nutrient cycling that goes there. We also recognize the challenges with some of our cooperators these days who want native grass but may be in a position where their smoke's going to bother somebody if they try to burn or they might not have the training, but we try to work with fire as much as we can. Uh, just to give you an idea of the scale of what we've been working on, this last fiscal year we worked with uh, landowners to implement what we call range planting on about 33,000 acres throughout the state. And so that, uh, that cooperation with the landowners could involve just technical assistance on site prep prior to seeding, or it might involve financial assistance in terms of offset some of that cost there. And so we work with a variety of situations there. That number fluctuates quite a bit, but you can see it's 38.5% of the national total of uh, NRCS dollars spent on range plant and planting happened in Texas. You know, Texas, Texas and really, uh, I would say Oklahoma is a close cousin to us that Texas is kind of the perfect storm because we're a very large state, lots of private land, so it's, it's the perfect place for NRCS to get a lot of work done. And so if you look at a lot of these conservation practices, we, we tend to lead in a lot of things out there like range planting, brush management, prescribed grazing, and some of these other conservation practices that we work with. But as you can see, a significant amount of acres that we're working with, and we run into a variety of situations. Um, and I'm going to go into these challenge, into challenges now. I'm going to point out five of the big challenges we see when trying to get one of these projects through and let it be successful. And so those challenges, uh, as we see it, are managing expectations, which is a huge one, a social type challenge that we, uh, we have a big job to relay to that landowner or that land manager on what they might be able to expect, how much, when, all those sorts of things. Native seed availability is something the previous presenter touched on. It's a, a very big issue. 
Um, we'll get into that. Of course, exotic and introduced grasses and other species. Precipitation is a big one, depending on what part of the state you're working in. Um, obviously, it affects us all, but in those more arid systems, you're rolling the dice, um, and, and we want to talk about that. Uh, maintaining the function of those prairies, once we get something established, too, we like to explain how we're talking about more of a process and not necessarily a one-time project. So let's talk about expectations first. How many of y'all these days have heard, we, you know, our culture has a fast food mentality. We want something now. We want it quickly. Uh, you can get it on your smartphone in 10 seconds, you know, if you're trying to find the answer to a question you didn't know. But with range planting and prairie restoration, we're usually talking about processes that tend to work fairly slow from the standpoint of other things that we're used to. If we're working with a farmer who wants to put some of his land back into native grass and he's used to growing grain sorghum or cotton, he's used to getting those seeds up in a very short amount of time and getting that crop out there. But with native grasses, we might have some, some species in the mix germinate at one time and then you need another set of climatic events to get the others to germinate. It can be a very slow process. Um, in parts of the state where Bermuda grass is used and we're putting out sprigs, it's apples and oranges. If you look at how fast some of these guys put it out, a lot of our cooperators that come in will talk about how, you know, I planted uh, coastal Bermuda grass the other day um, and now six months later that same year they got their first cutting of hay off of it. Extremely fast planting, extremely successful, extremely productive, but with native species, we're not putting vegetative material out there. That seed has to germinate, establish, and there has to be management that goes along with it. With a lot of our native plantings, depending on where you're at in the state, a common recommendation that we'll make out there is it might take one to three years to get good establishment out there. And that first year is just luck of the draw. Especially the drier you are, it's really hard to tell what you're gonna get. And even some of the plantings that have been in East Texas, um, some of those uh, have been three-year plantings in what I would call a pretty wet rainfall environment, 40 inches or more of rain. So that's a big deal. Now let's talk about the range planting paradigm as we get into this. The, a lot of, when we talk about prairie restoration, this is what we have in our head a lot of time. Usually tall grass prairie, big blue, little blue, switchgrass, Indian. As far as you can see, hardly any woody vegetation. And the, and the point I want to make here is that you got those plant species there, but we're starting to ask ourselves these questions every day about what that soil is like below the ground that those plants are growing on. Uh, is, it a, is it a fungal dominated soil? Is it more bacteria dominated? What's the pH of it? Has the structure been altered in any way? Um, all these things are extremely important. On um, these prairies, there was a, a talk I was in before lunch where they talked about um, uh, the inches of rain that would infiltrate in an hour. And there was a comparison of native grassland to pasture land, and the, and the ratio was about eight inches an hour to somewhere around one inch of an hour per hour. I think that speaks a lot to the uh, hydro hydrologic cycle. We went out to one of these relic native grass hay fields. It's pretty much little blue stem and Indian grass just outside of Belleville and measured in the field and right across the entrance to the property in an old hay field that hadn't been taken care of. We found very similar relationship. So I think we're on to something here. And if you want to talk about getting a landowner's attention who's trying to grow grass and they understand they need water, that's an attention getter there that you can get that much more water in the ground and uh, it's interesting from the uh, urban planning standpoint, when we talk about flooding and those kinds of issues, um, it seems like infiltration is being talked about more and more and more. And so it's an exciting opportunity. So this situation here where you've got these grasses, we understand that we've got a certain type of soil structure there. We probably have mit microbial life going on. We have uh, nutrient cycling. We probably have a water uh, cycle that's functioning as well. Most of the people that come to us that ask for range planting bring us this, okay? So we're talking about something now where we don't have cover, we've got decreased organic matter in the soil. They're looking for, they've got a, they've got an, a crisis on their hands and they're looking for something, to, a way to fix it. And so they've come in the door and said, how can we fix this? But with decreased organic matter, compaction in the soil, maybe topsoil that's been lost, um, that is a, uh, this is a, this is not a battle, but a war. We're fixing to go try to fix this right here and help that landowner do it. So we get some of these situations that are extremely challenging to try to fix here, obviously severely overgrazed. Now in East Texas, you know, if you start with cover, 
Uh, some of the, the Parks and Wildlife guys showed us some of these plantings here, and it's hard to tell in this picture exactly what you're looking at. But the interesting thing here in a more humid environment was they had lots of cover to start with. Lots of it was Bermuda grass and Bahia grass, but this was more of a conversion pro project. And so they had cover, they had organic matter, um, and they probably had a functioning water cycle. And with some management practices in here, they really tipped the scale, went in there, treated those introduced species, and planted natives here, and pretty successful in a pretty high rate of time. Um, a pretty good rate of speed, I would say. And so, you know, where you're at has a lot to do with it, and where your starting point has a whole lot to do with it as well. Now, we get into a lot of brush-dominated landscapes where we have someone that comes in who may have purchased a property. Uh, it's been under the same sort of management for 70, 80, 90 years, and they want to open it up more, say, for upland birds or something like that, and treat it. You know, these types of situations, if we're looking to take a shrubland or brushland and convert that back to prairie, are, um, they're expensive, but I feel like our rate of success is actually pretty good on it, believe it or not. And the reason I would say that is because of a lot, we may have lost some soil here, but we still have a lot of plant life here. We have a lot of microbial interactions going on, and very importantly, within that brush, we have a pretty good seed source more times than not. I'll show you an example of that outside of Carrizo Springs. A mesquite, prickly pear dominated landscape here, very little herbaceous under it, but with a few um, herbicide treatments. This is all uh, Plains bristle grass, Arizona cotton top, southwestern bristle grass, four flower trichloris that's come back from the native seed bank coming up there. So it's uh, very encouraging that some of our sites can be so resilient and have the opportunity to come back. Um, so like, that's why I say on some of those brush dominated landscapes, I um, feel like our uh, odds of success of converting that to prairie or grassland are pretty good. We work with a lot of cropland situations where maybe we had marginal cropland that was broken out at one time and farmed. It was highly erodible land. They had to follow a highly erodible land plan. Um, and they've decided it's not worth it anymore for one reason or another and want to put that land back in grass. And so the exciting thing there is, since it's cropland, is we can use conventional farm equipment more times than not. We're not dealing with shallow rocky soils or lots of woody debris or things like that. So we have the ability to use drills or maybe even prep that site with cover crops or some other things to try to jumpstart that soil. Obviously, how that land's been treated while it's been cropland is very important to the restoration process as well in terms of soil structure, fertility, and microbial life. Here's an example of a cropland um, conversion to native grass, very successful in South Texas. You can see this was uh, hit the rain really good within one year, very good stand. This is more a four or five year type project about 30 miles west of Kingsville. And uh, the thing I would point out here is that success is in the eye of the beholder. If you came from somewhere where you're used to solid grass across the ground, you might be disappointed in this. We still got a lot of bare ground out there, a lot of patches, but we grow lots of annual weeds for, depending on what type of species you're managing for, um, this was a fantastic wildlife property and lots of bird diversity, lots of bobwhite quail on it. So which used to be, you know, pretty much a below sand pea field or a grain field. Okay, so to, to drive that point home, thinking about where we're at and managing our expectations. If we're starting somewhere where we have a degraded soil, we've got to manage those expectations. It's going to be probably a long, hard fight to get it to where we need to be. And uh, the, the length of that fight depends on how many resources we're able to throw that. Um, the comment was made in the other talk. You know, the situation might be that uh, we don't want to till, but maybe in this hard pan, we have to do that once or twice to get it started. And so we're, we're looking at all the tools on, in the toolbox um, when it comes to restoration as to how to get it there. Maybe it's a means to an end where we can do something like use tillage or herbicide or something like that, but then be able to back away from that practice over the long run. If we're working with a site on, the, on this side of the scale where we have the functioning water cycle and uh, good nutrient cycling, you know, the sky's the limit. I think the rate of speed there is, uh, is, much, is much quicker there in terms of restoration. Native seed availability. You know, as far as the second challenge here, one of the most interesting talks that I heard um, in my time of dealing with this was to have one of the commercial growers get up here and talk about the seed business. And so we've got to think about on some of those guys, 
um, if they want to provide a low successional um, grass to the marketplace, say like gaping panicum or something like that, I don't know, Texas grama or those sorts of things, they're thinking about how much, what's it going to cost me to grow this and how many people are going to come buy it from me? You know, they're going to have to be, you're talking about a pretty specific set of the marketplace there for them to grow, you know, enough pounds to make it economically viable for them. You know, if they look at their projected sales and it's going to be 100 pounds of Texas grama a year, it's probably not worth it for a lot of those guys. You know, maybe they want to do it for the good of conservation, but I think the reality with most folks that we come in contact with is that, um, they are unable to be a conservationist at any price. You'll follow what I'm saying? If they're in business to be a grower, they're in business to be a grower. And so um, it's very interesting to try to develop that market. Uh, I think they, uh, the growers are looking into that. I think the recent oil and gas activity that we've had in a lot of the state has driven a lot of that. And so um, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting, it's encouraging, but that, that time from when a specific plant is developed and released by a plant materials center or someone out that and picked up by a grower. I mean, a lot of these plants, we have locally adapted ecotypes of various plants out there, but it's so important for that grower to be able to pick it up and then make it available in the marketplace. And the scale of the project is a big deal. You know, when you work with, uh, maybe you've got 10 acres beside your house you want to redo, or you know an urban project um, like we were listening to in the previous talk, you've got a lot more tools I think available. Where whereas some of our guys, you know, if they want to do a 400 acre pro project in one pasture of their ranch, you know, native hay or something like that's not going to be a log logistically possible for them. So they're looking for more of a traditional type seeding effort. So that that seed availability is a big deal, and I don't have a uh, clear answer for that, but I think the mid to early successional species are important. We might have to look at annuals for some of those to fill that void and get something there and know that they won't persist, but there's always, uh, I think every site's different, and that's why you're always going to see those mixes tailored to try to work with what we have that might grow in that area, even if it's not, not the, uh, the perfect fit. Exotic and introduced species, I think this is a huge one. Um, that we see, we get folks that come in that you know absolutely hate B Bermuda grass or hate Bahia grass or buffalo grass or whatever it is. You know, pick your poison um, if they don't like that. And then we have, you know, the same day we might have someone come in that say that you know this grass saved my ranch. I'd be, I'd have had to sell it a long time ago if I didn't have this out here for forage or whatnot. So we get pulled a lot of different ways on these introduced grasses. Um, but we do get a lot of customers that come in that are interested in conversions on their place. They're usually wildlife oriented type folks. And, um, you know, this is a tough fight, a very tough fight for us. Uh, we have to remember that a lot of these plants that came in are some of the most aggressive, adapted to degraded conditions. They're very tolerant of uh, heavy grazing. They are uh, uh, very, very good reseeders and that sort of thing. So especially in the drier part of the state, um, it's very difficult to convert something like King Ranch Blue Stem or something like that. We have seen some projects that have been successful. Uh, sometimes things work and it say, well, what was the big deal? This worked pretty good for us. We see a lot of them that fail. And, um, you know, by that same token, the ones that seem to be successful are usually the ones that are a long drawn out process where you have some sort of mechanical initial treatment followed by a series of herbicide treatments um, on those plants to try to eliminate that competition and then fill that void as fast as you can with plants that will germinate and essentially, you know, fill the spaces in the soil where a plant could grow to get something you want in there. The longer you leave it bare, the better the chance something's going to come in that you don't want. So, and you know, on the subject of pasture, I'll show you a couple examples. Uh, I was at a holistic management course one time when they talked about manage for what you want, not for what you don't want. I thought about that more and more. And you take a typical pasture situation and what a lot of folks do on pastures, say, okay, I'm going to weed spray. I want to try to keep it a monoculture. I'm going to put fertility out here for some of these grasses that need fertility. And that's what I would have to do to meet my goal of having a productive pasture. If you want something that's more diverse, then you have to say, what are the management practices that go with that? That's probably not providing fertility, that's probably not spraying, that's probably limited grazing and not constant grazing and things like that. 
And it's, it's very interesting to see on some of the pasture what will happen if you just leave it alone and let it come back. And this particular photo in North Texas, they stop. All these red circles here are showing uh, milkweed coming back into this pasture that you know pretty much was a monoculture before. I was in Tyler last week, and this is uh, Bermuda grass, Bahia grass that they abandoned and decided they're going to plant trees on. And so it hadn't had any fertility for several years and hadn't been sprayed for several years. And what you're seeing in the background there is broom sedge blue stem and split beard blue stem. But a tremendous amount of cover, tall grass. I mean, it's very exciting that some of these things start to happen here. And this was paid for with patience. You know, there wasn't a big seeding project here. There weren't any $15,000 no-till drills. Um, none of that stuff came into play here. It just came back on its own. So it's, it is exciting to see what you can do with management. Okay, precipitation. You know, I think everyone knows that we need water for, um, uh, you know, to get good establishment. It's a no-brainer, right? On those prairies, I think, I think what the point I want to make here is that we really need to back up on some of those prairies and, and think about how we've been managing them. And a lot of these places are grazed. And how we've been managing those prayers, uh, prairies and what we have left at this point. And I was sitting there um, uh, thinking a minute ago, you know, how many places on the coastal prairie have I seen big blue stem in my career? Not many. I bet I can count them on my fingers. All right. I mean, it's just, and, and, but yet the historic records would indicate that it was probably widespread three, four hundred years ago. I think that has a lot to be said about how those prairies have been managed and that being a preferred species by livestock. So the amount of grazing pressure that a lot of these places have had over time, you know, hasn't lent, themsel lent itself well to maintaining those species. And I think a big part of that is managing with drought. And just looking at these rainfall records here, what you're seeing is 100 years of rainfall data um, from outside of Fort Worth on the red line. The average is the horizontal blue line across the page. So how many times do you hit average? Almost never, right, according to this data set. And so with our livestock operators, now not all of them, okay, we have some very good operators. I mean, we have uh, just a wide gamut of what we see out there that comes through the door of our offices. But with the livestock operator, the challenge is where do you want to be? Do you want to try to manage for that blue line? If you're going to manage where that blue line is, you have to be very, very flexible and challenging. Animals have to get on trucks and go places, and dollars have to change hands pretty regularly. That's pretty uncommon with a lot of our operators. Now, if you look at the green line, if the property is stocked and managed in a way that it will not cause harm to the property during the drought, during the drought so that green line, 90% of the time, you're going to be fine. Okay, you're not going to run out of grass. You're probably not going to hurt the habitat and those sorts of things. The challenge is, is that for the livestock operator, is that they are generating enough revenue being stocked that light to, for them to justify that enterprise and being out on the land. So, you know, you're going to hear the term flexibility being thrown around all the time on some of those. And more, I would, you know, every time I talk to a rancher and I say, where's the hardest place to manage? They always say right here. Okay. But, you know, every place is going to have its challenges. And thinking about where you're at, looking at that rainfall and managing those livestock in a way that they don't do harm to the land is a huge deal, whether you're in a 50 inch rainfall belt or in a 10 inch rainfall belt. It's a lot of what we work with with folks on grazing management, whether they're managing for prairie or they're just managing to stay in business. And so uh, that, that, that's a key point there. And, and you know, a lot of the, if you listen to a lot of the old range scientists, professors and stuff like that, they'll talk about damage done some, during, during some of these droughts is never made up for. You know, you talk about the drought of the 50s or something like that. Some of those ranches to this day don't produce what they used to produce prior to the drought of the 50s. So it's something to think about. I know every uh, workshop we go to probably has something about drought in it. But the key there is that drought's always been a part of our landscape. And you know, it's, it's not the livestock's fault per se, but it's the management of the livestock that I think deserves the, the attention there. And uh, not to take away, uh, I don't want to draw a bead on the industry. Like I said, we work with some operators that are very that excel at this, and then we work with some other places that have challenges. So I'm not saying that all of them are bad. Okay, maintaining function is another thing with these. You know, when you talk about exotic grass conversion or you talk about conversion from a brush-dominated landscape, it's definitely a process and not just a, um, a one-time project. 
when, uh, when you look at the implementation of this, you know, it's a huge deal with any of these seeding projects to get a proper seedbed preparation and planted right. Uh, the worst thing uh, in the seeding world, you know, a group like South Texas Natives I used to work, uh, partner with on some projects would say is, the worst thing is, is a planting that wasn't done right and then that operator goes tells his neighbor it won't work for him. Having a good seed bed and good equipment to put that seed in the ground and giving it a chance is a huge deal. If that seed's planted too deep or it's planted in a cloddy seed bed, you're, you're never getting out of the gate. You're never giving it a chance. So that's a, that's a big deal. But following up the management, once we've plant, planted grass or done the brushwork or whatever it is out there and maintaining this is a big deal. Managing woody encroachment is also something else. You know, these, grass, these graphs right here, or these pictures are showing you on your, uh, let's see, on your right hand side, anything that's yellow or orange is significant mesquite canopy. Anything on your left hand side is juniper canopy. And so I don't have to tell you that we have a lot of brush in Texas. What I am going to tell you is that we have seed distributed across the landscape like we didn't have three or 400 years ago. So the dynamics have changed some. And so that fire return interval that might have happened in 1600 or whatever might not be sufficient or it may take additional practices to keep that brush in check nowadays because of that widespread seed source across the landscape. So the big, th the big drivers once we've, we're established is grazing management and prescribed fire, realizing that you know, depending on where your property is located, you may or may not be able to implement that. On the ranches we work with, these are our huge tools. They're our most economical tools as well. And so we put a lot of stock in that and trying to manage the timing, distribution, frequency, and intensity of those two disturbances on the property. With fire, I think we've got a lot of work to do with our media, and we need to post that. This is a shot from the Rolling Plains. This is, this, this is the picture that usually makes the news when we have a wildfire or something like that. Um, we, need to, we need to work with them to show them that fire can be a really good tool. We also need to have realistic expectations that fire's not gonna kill every stick of brush out there, hardly any of it, but we can use it as a management tool. This is the same shot a month later, just goes to show if you don't have temperature, things aren't gonna grow, they've had moisture here. But this is the picture that the news needs to get later. You know, how this landscape can respond and be healthy and functioning. You get to looking at the ground out there, there's a lot of diversity out there, tremendous amount of species riches, both plants, insects, animals, and I would suggest, I think you'll find that in the soil as well. So in summary, uh, the two points that I'd like to drive home for this presentation is that those realistic expectations for your specific property that you're managing are huge and uh, we're happy to work with you to try to share experiences we've had to, to develop those experiences, I mean, uh, develop those expectations. And the big thing there too at the bottom is you have to adapt to the changing conditions. If you're looking at a grass conversion project from introduced grass to native grass, and you do your best for the first three years and five years down the road, you see introduced grass coming in, you might have to go back and implement another practice to keep that stuff in check. And so I, I think the key is that all great plans have one thing in common, and that's that they're always revised. And so that's what we tell anyone with a grazing plan, with a brush management plan, is we just have to adapt. You know, every year is different on the property. But again, I thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, present this information, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions if there's any time. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, kind of the East Texas conversion of the hay and the Bermuda grass, and we're looking at a situation where we want to do that. Um, what, uh, if you weren't going to leave it alone, what would be your recommendation? Um, what we've seen on a couple projects over there, and these are Parks and Wildlife projects, we, there's a great native grass guy working for Parks and Wildlife over there. Um, their typical treatment was either to mow it or burn it first and then repeated rounds of either Cimarron or Roundup depending on um, what, the, what was there. Of course, the, the Cimarron is very effective on Bahia grass. So two or three, two or three sprays and then no-till drill, I believe, is the, their typical um, plan of attack. And they actually have a, a, a grass drill that uh, should have some available. I can't, John, you might be able to speak to that, but. Depending on where you are, there's, uh, there's your parts of wildlife that you'll find a native seed drill that has the right hopper and the right equipment to plant that plus the seed. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Uh, have you done any long-term monitoring of go-back pasture, go-back pr uh, prairie range, where you looked at it for over the years in the presence uh, of fire, but no more soil disturbance? We take soil disturbance out of the picture and just keep burning it to perpetuate that kind of old field community. Is there any long-term monitoring of that? Um, you know, I think everyone heard the question. I can't say that we have done any long-term monitoring. It would be pretty more more along the lines of just anecdotal type stuff or like we've worked with the rent this ranch and we know this pasture's been burned four or five times in the last 15 years kind of thing and um, you know it seems very site specific as to what we get some of those guys uh, that were burning buffalo grass pastures had just as much buffalo grass after four burns some of them summer burns some of them winter burns as they did when they started other guys uh, we pushed the envelope on some buffalo grass dominated pastures when the soil was very dry and we got a tremendous native grass response after one burn. So uh, it appears to be fairly unpredictable. I usually bet on the introduced grass being there. Most of it's pretty fire, fire adapted. Any other questions for Jason? Okay. Thank y'all.